Greetings, Miss Dornick. My name is Harry Selden. I am a professor at Streeling University on Trantor. Hey guys, Pete here. Today we've got a breakdown of Foundation Episode 5. Upon Awakening takes us back in time, and it's the first episode where we don't see anything involving the Cleons. We also start to get answers about what happened with Gale and Rach, and watch as things continue to develop on Terminus. I'm going to recap everything we saw, and then I'll give you my thoughts on what happened, what I think it means going forward. And before we get into that, I just have to give you a spoiler warning. If you haven't watched episode 5 yet, then this video isn't for you. With that out of the way, let's get into it. Season 1, episode 5 opens with Gail telling us about the stories that scared her the most as a child. They were about black holes. It was the idea of an event horizon. Venture into that and the gravitational pull prevents you from turning back. Escape becomes impossible and you can see the parallel of what's going on with her after she made the decision to try to solve the Abraxas conjecture. In flashback, we go back to see how that played out. At one point, Gail was involved with the Seer Church. She was an acolyte, and this seems to be a point of pride for her parents, as her community has turned to their faith in light of this climate catastrophe that's going on on their planet. The sea level's rising, that's threatening their way of life, and we hear how it's getting more and more difficult for her family to make their living through the farming of algae. We already understood this from the first episode, so the main thing here is this connection she has with an old family friend who's been labeled as a heretic. She finds him one night after going to the university which is supposed to be abandoned. He's there looking through the books and when she tells him that he needs to leave because the seers have condemned the building, he says that the books are heretical, right? That all analytical learning goes against the faith of the awakening. He says the line here that we heard her say to Rach, that when a planet wants you dead, you die. She tries to get him to leave without the books, and he offers her the writing from Callie, which is what she'll end up using to solve the problem that gets her to Trantor. The last thing he tells her is the cleanse will pass. All things have a cycle. The knowledge helps to survive the destruction until the rebirth arrives. And you see Gale try to reframe his statements to fit the church's ideas that the floods are a challenge from the sleeper, that they just have to endure and then eventually it'll all get better. He counters that people did this, we did this, not the slumbering god. So this guy is the localized version of Harry Seldon, right? He sees this collapse is coming that can't be stopped by putting your faith into this church's system. Later we see him being executed for being a heretic, as an acolyte, Gail is there, she has to help prepare him for the ceremony, and the books are submerged with him. His final statement is that this will not stop the seas from rising. And there's a seed planted there, so Gail goes back alone later. She swims down and recovers Calais' writing, and even though she's starting to rise up in the ranks of the church, she starts reading about math, she uses her new knowledge to solve the Abraxas conjecture, and eventually she enters the competition and gets the message that she solved it and that Harry will validate her proof. He tells her that the Empire will be reaching out, but that he hopes that she'll come to Streeling University on Trantor to meet him. Which of course we've already seen her do that. We get a little bit more of her parents being pissed. Her father tells her he'd rather his daughter die than go to the machine world of Trantor. But at this point, knowing there's nothing left on Synax but destruction, she's past the point of no return and decides to choose science over faith, hoping that she can find a way to save her people through getting off the planet and going to work with Harry Seldon. It cuts back to the present timeline, and we see her escape pod being brought inside this ship where she wakes up. She remembers Harry's death and notices that she has Rach's knife inside the pod. That comes in handy when she can't open the door. The knife is pulled into this slot and is basically the key. And as she goes inside, we realize that the ship's AI thinks that she's Rach, as it's initiating things for his arrival. She finds out she's alone there, and that the ship won't give her access to some functions because, again, she's not Rach. She's not the person the ship was expecting. She finds out that she was asleep for nearly 35 years, so what's happening here is happening at the same time as what's going on with Salvor and the Encyclopedist on Terminus. 
We see them, and it picks up right where they left off. Salvor's looking at the large weapon just outside the fence, and the fact that the Anacreons are using a cloaking device, they're hiding it from someone other than the people on Terminus, confirms that their motive goes beyond Terminus itself. And right at that moment, the Imperial jump ship arrives, and now we know what's going on. Back at Terminus City, you see that the encyclopedists are thrilled that they actually came, that the Empire is backing them up, but also that this is exactly what Pharaoh was hoping would happen. The ship, the Aegis, makes contact and essentially learn that they don't have any military. They talk to Salvor, who's the warden, and she explains that they confessed to destroying the communications buoy, and so he wants to talk to Pharaoh directly to see what she has to say about that. Salvor thinks this is a mistake, but her communications are jammed before she can really say her piece, and then Lewis goes to get Farah and bring her into the tower. This sets off red flags. With the troops surrounding the fence, Salvor doesn't want Farah to go anywhere near the tower, and so she races to the city. There she realizes she's too late. Lewis is already taking Farah over to the tower, and there she pulls out a field disruptor that she hid in her fake eyeball, and when she detonates that, that shuts down the fence. The Anacreon warriors are then able to charge into the city, and you see that they are killing some of the colonists. The Imperial ship sees what's happening on the ground and starts to land, while Salvor is looking for Farah, who has taken her mother hostage. When she finds her, there's an intense standoff where Salvor won't drop her gun to save her mother, and after that works out, they have a crazy one-on-one -on -one fight where Salvor eventually gets the upper hand, but Farah's men are there, they have her mother again, so it's essentially a standoff. Later, when they're looking over the destruction, Farah points out that Terminus isn't innocent. She says that Selden's predictions are what inflamed the Empire in the first place. Because of what their prophet said, her whole world burned, and there is some truth to that, I guess, from her perspective, although there is this ongoing mystery of who actually blew up the Star Bridge. The fighting continues on the ground, people are definitely dying, we see Hugo get shot, and then as the Imperial ship approaches, we see that the Anacreons were assembling that weapon in order to take out the ship, and we see it come down to the ground. So we see what their larger plan was, although it's not clear to me what the motivation behind it is. We're gonna have to wait and see, because they're not actually in a position to be able to fight back if a full-blown battle breaks out with the Empire. It feels like it has to be more specific to that ship or this location, but we don't find out before the episode ends. Back on the ship, Gale can't get authorized to do anything important like send a message or guide the ship somewhere different. She is able to do a search of the Imperial database though, and she learns that the slow ship did make it to Terminus. She looks into Harry's death. She finds out the official story is that he was murdered by Rach, and she's listed as an accomplice. And per his own directive, Harry was ejected in a casket he designed himself. And we do see his body being sent out into space. She searches for Rach and finds footage of him being questioned by the encyclopedists. Louis Perrin is now in charge after Harry's death. Rach admits that he murdered Harry and won't say much about it other than implying that he understands more about why things happened the way they did than Louis does. For his crime, he is executed, and we see him get space. They throw him outside in the vacuum without a suit. Before that happens, we see his final words. He says, I know it's hard. I know what I've done seems incomprehensible. But you can never lose faith in the plan ever. You can still solve a puzzle, even with a piece missing. And it almost feels like he's talking directly to Gale here, knowing that he put her on the escape pod in his place. Of course, she breaks down after watching this, and there's a point where she briefly contemplates suicide. She brings a scalpel into the shower, thinking about her time with Rach, and then before she can go through with it, the ship changes its course, and that flips her around. It gives her a chance to think, and she decides to try to figure out what's going on. There's a somewhat long sequence where she can't find out where they're going. The ship won't tell her where they're going. So she uses the information she can get in math to figure out what direction they're going in. Then she can't see outside because there's a view screen. So she goes and she finds a suit, tethers herself, does a spacewalk. She can't see anything at first with the naked eye, but once she looks in infrared, she realizes they're heading towards a dark star. 
With that information, Gale realizes that their destination is Helicon, Harry's homeworld, which we don't have a lot of background about in the show. And as she's figuring that out, she starts to see some strange things. She sees what looks like puddles of blood, and then she comes across a glitched out projection of Harry, where he looks like he did the last time she saw him, and the episode ends there. This is probably related to the device we saw Rach remove from behind his ear. Harry is dead, but now it's apparent there was more to his plan that would happen after that event. This week had a lot of promising signs about how they planned the story out. I find myself pretty invested in what's going to happen. I think the show still has some pacing issues and don't necessarily love how they structured things jumping around, but we are getting answers to questions they encouraged us to have, and we can see that they're pulling on threads that were left dangling in the early episodes. Finding out that Rach sacrificed himself to get Gale out is an interesting twist. Kind of sad to see him go, and the flashback to Synax does a good job to define her character, but then also makes you wonder how that all came to be, considering that's what led her to where she's at, and then on top of that, she would have never seen Harry's death if she hadn't had a feeling about that. His return was a genuine shock, although I wish they hadn't put off the reveal of what's going on there. The way things have been, it may be a couple of episodes before we get back to that, but it is still fun to think about how the ship she's on plays a part in his plan. I guess we can say for sure that he planned ahead and recruited Rach to help him with his death, but it's hard to say how Gale being there instead will change things going forward. Hopefully her seeing Harry at the end of his life is evidence that his whole consciousness was downloaded, and she'll be able to interact with him rather than him just being some welcoming hologram or something like that. A lot of this episode is about motivations. There's a continuation of the idea of faith from the last episode, and we do see Gale pick science over that. But more, we see that Gale's motivations are reinforced, and Acreon's motivations against Terminus are starting to take shape, and we know what was behind Rach killing Harry. The ship Gale finds herself on looks pretty great. The production is still over the top, and the shot of the Aegis coming down was amazing looking. Once again, Terminus turns out to be less interesting than the other story, which is disappointing since that is the beginning of the actual foundation. Even without Trantor and the clones, Terminus is still coming in second place. But we are only halfway there, so there's still plenty of time, and I'm still interested to see how things fall into place. It's kind of fun that at this point, as a book reader, I'm not sure where we're going from here. I'm not sure what they mean here when they say a dark star, or why Rach would be headed to Helicon. I'm guessing since they had that whole sequence to show that Gale couldn't see it with her naked eye, it has something to do with its strange properties. Of course, I did look it up, but couldn't decide what they were going for here based on the limited information they gave us in the show. And I think that's a good place to leave things. Let me know in the comments what you thought about this episode, and where you're hoping they go from here. If you want to talk book spoilers, I'm all for it. Just mark those so you won't spoil things for show only people. Please like this video if you enjoyed it. Please subscribe to my channel if you haven't already. And thanks for watching. I'll talk to you soon.